What a great time of worship, great time to be together, great to be joining with all of you online as well and those here in the, in the room. We are in a series called It's Spiritual. So if this is your first week, if you're here at Meadow Park for the first time joining online, congratulations, you came on a Sunday where we're talking about money and stuff at church. Yeah, let's give an applause for that, let's give a hand for that. That's exciting, I know, we don't, we come to church, we don't, we, you know, we, we sometimes have this strange idea that we can't talk about money in church because there's spiritual things and then there's money and finances and business and, and we'll handle that part, God, you t- take care of everything else. Well, one of the key foundations, if you don't remember anything else from the series, just remember that it's spiritual, spiritual with a dollar sign. How we handle our money and our things absolutely has everything to do with our faith as well. Because when we talk about faith and and we talk about life and and in the church, one of our responsibilities, our main responsibility is to to make disciples, to grow as followers of Christ, and to learn what it means to be a fully surrendered follower of Jesus. And so money is a part of everyday life, isn't it not? I mean, it's part of everything we do in so many different ways in so many places, and so we have to learn, we have to understand what does it mean to handle our resources and our things in a God-honoring way, in a spiritual way. And so as we have been looking, even as we began last week, that there's this connection between our, our faith and our finances. That, that Jesus said, look, you can't serve both God and money. You'll love one and hate the other. You'll despise one and be devoted to the other. That there's this connection. You have to make a choice. And, and what we understood is that, that God's not after our money. It's not that God's after our money. What he's after, he's after our heart. He said, as Kyle mentioned earlier, right in the scripture, wherever your treasure is, there your heart is also. Our heart follows our treasure. Jesus said there's this link between these two. And so if God's not after our our money, he's after our heart. And the way he finds our heart is how we handle our finances. It'll grow us in different areas of our faith. And so as we look at the series and, and we see this connection, God, how can I become more and more like you? One of the challenges and I think one of the greatest obstacles why some of us are not growing in our faith is because we have separated out this area of finances from our faith. And so I think some of us are stunted spiritually because we're like, this part is an area God can't speak into. And while that's a problem, while that's a challenge, it's also one of the greatest opportunities because it means that when we get this part of our lives right or we start growing in this part of our lives, we can start growing in faith. We start growing spiritually in these different ways. And so this is the beauty of the series is that that we can actually grow in, in faithfulness and in trust and in generosity and understanding purpose all in the way that we approach our finances. And so that's what we wanna talk about, and that's what we're talking about in this series uh, over the next several weeks. Now just the front, uh, just to say too, of course as a church, we um, need resources as a church and as a ministry. The mission of God has been funded by the church and by faithful people throughout the generations. There's an absolute part uh, part of that. So you know, again, uh, up front, will at some point we be talking about giving to the church? Yes. (laughs) Do I have a problem about asking people to give to the church? No. (laughs) Not at all, because if I said don't give anything ever to the church, we wouldn't be here. So which way is it gonna be? Either we're gonna fund the things that are important, we're gonna give and we're gonna invest in the kingdom of God, or we're not. And we are, as Meadow Park, we have a history of strong and generous giving that has been involved in missions and globally and locally. And and so I, I will never hesitate to ask you for more money. So if you don't like that, don't, don't be involved in ministry or in faith or in church because that's how we do a lot. That's not the only thing we do. It's not the only way we do it. We give in a lot of different ways, but that is gonna be a part of what we talk about in the series because this is how we grow spiritually and this is how the kingdom purposes are accomplished by, by the generosity of God's people. And as we grow in generosity in, in what we give, we grow as individuals in, our, in who we are in our character. So we'll be talking about that. But one of the things we're looking at today is, is this, this challenge of, of wanting to have an abundance in life. We want resources. I think all of us want to be well taken care of. Do we not, financially? Let's be honest on that, right? None of us say, look, oh, I hope to struggle my whole life, right? I think we can agree. We all would like to be in a position where we can meet the basic needs for our life and for our family. And more than just the basic needs, we'd like to enjoy life in some ways. We want to provide well for our kids. We want to take care of those around us. We want to be able to do good things in this world. That we, we want an abundance. We'd like to have enough. And so we, we pursue life to, to, to that end. We try to get a, you know, good jobs, and we work hard, and we try to save and do the things that we can to have an abundance in life. But there's also that, that, there's that goal, and then there's this other goal that, especially as followers of Christ, that we may struggle with is saying, okay, well, how do I handle then this, this idea of faithfulness to God? 
with my resources and my things. And they seem to be in competition. Like, like, like God doesn't want us to have any good things. He may not want us to have an abundance. And, and, and can I keep anything for myself? And, and there's this wrestling between faithfulness and abundance. You guys ever feel that tension, anyone? Am I the only one that ever feels that tension? Because I feel that tension too. I feel like how much is too much for myself and for others. And, 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 it's, and there's not a, a set formula on that. But this is the, the tension that we're in. And we want to arrive one day at the, at the steps of heaven, standing before God, as he looks at us, and, and, and we want him to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And that's the commendation as followers of Christ that we long to hear in that day, that, that God would look at us, you've done well. You've handled it well, good job. And so today what we're going to look at, we're going to look at this idea of faithfulness in part two of our series, faithfulness, and where the origin of this, this, uh, this, this verse, this well done, my good and faithful servant, where does that come from? What's the context? And in this context, we'll see how that commendation comes to the servant when he stands before his master. So today we're gonna look at faithfulness, we're gonna look at our resources and what God's given us and how we approach that. So let's just uh, pause for a moment and really just open our hearts to ask God to speak into this area of our lives. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truths of scripture, this reference that we can continue to come back, this foundation that we can build our lives on that is true and that is right and that is holy and helpful. And so God, in this area of finances that, that can sometimes make us uncomfortable or, or, or become very private, Lord, we just ask God that, that before you, we would open our hearts and allow you to speak into this area of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, I've got a lot of ground to cover, so buckle your seatbelts, you ready? There's a lot in here. We're gonna be looking at a parable of Matthew chapter 25. So we're gonna look at the story that Jesus tells. And in Matthew chapter 25, he tells three stories. Three stories, again, a parable is a parallel story. And he's saying, in the kingdom of heaven, which we can't see and sometimes struggle to understand, let me tell you a story from, from this life that you can relate to to understand what's happening in the spiritual kingdom of heaven. And in this chapter 25, he's talking about at the end of time, one day when you stand before your maker, what is gonna be some of the criteria? What are gonna be some of the things that he's gonna look at as he assesses our lives and, and, and says, all right, come on in. Inherit the, the kingdom that's been prepared for you. He tells three different stories. We're gonna look at this one here in just a moment. And in this one story in, in chapter 25, he says the, the kingdom of heaven's like a man going on a journey. It's like this guy that, 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 that leaves for a while. And, um, and before he leaves, he calls his servants together and he, he distributes some of his estate to them and they're gonna manage these, what he's been given, uh, what they've been given. And then he's gone. And so they get to work and they each do something different with what they've been given and eventually the man comes back and he calls them to, to give an account for what they've done and they begin to share. Here's what I've done, the first servant, the second servant, the third servant. And now they're gonna see what's, what's their reward and how does the master respond and so this is the, the, the parable that we're gonna look at to see, okay, what, what has been entrusted to us and how do we handle that? And so let's look at this story and as before we, I mean, as we jump into it, what we're gonna look at is the foundational kingdom financial principles. That's a mouthful right there, right? But these are, but what we see in the story are, are these foundational kingdom financial principles that, that really give us a, a look back and say, how do we approach our things and our stuff? And there's so many great principles in this. So let's begin with the, the, the beginning here, this first verse that Jesus introduces the story with. Matthew 25, 14. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. It's an introductory sentence here, but there is already a lot in this that, that begins to apply and help us understand some, some principles of the kingdom. If you're listening to the, you know, if we listen to the story and you, you picture, okay, what's Jesus trying to say? There's a man going on a long trip. He's gonna be gone for a while. What's he talking about? Who's he talking about? Jesus, right? He came and he's left. He, he left us. He's, he's like the man who's going on a long trip. And, and the servants, who are the servants? That's us. He's called the servants together and he's entrusted them with some of his money. And there he goes. He's gone on a long trip and he entrusted it to them to do something with it while he was gone. So one of the first principles that we see here in this story is that well, number one, God is the owner. This is such a foundational kingdom financial principle that God is the owner. And I think maybe theologically we kinda go, yeah, I get that, God's the owner. But, but practically speaking, do we really see that everything is God's, that he is the owner, that everything has been given um, to us through him? 
Because you see, ownership is a huge deal. We, we think of ownership, and, and if it's ours, if, if we own it, well, then we, then we approach it and say, okay, this is our money to do with as we please. So everything we have, I, I just make my decisions. And what do I base those decisions on? I meet my needs, I take care of my family, I do some nice things, I try to save a little bit. I, I'm the owner. This is mine. I worked hard for it. I did everything I could for it. Do you know how I busted my butt and studied for, for that degree? And, and you know how hard I was working to move up in the company? Do you know the risks that I took to start that company and to be an entrepreneur? Do you know how, how much I've done? You know how little I had, but I was smart in the way I invested, the, what I squirreled away? And, and, and we start taking that pride of, of, of that ownership. You know, I know that's an inherited from my family, but you know, my family, my dad, my mom, they started this business, and so this is ours to do with now what we need. Well, yes and no. Who's the owner? Who is really responsible? Whose stuff is all of this that, that, that we are talking about? Whose money is it? It's kind of like, uh, I think about our, our kids, like they, our kids, they have stuff, right, that they claim as their own. You guys have kids at home, right? They claim things, this is my phone, or this is my, you know, my, my jacket, or this is my room, and, and as parents, we let them have some of that ownership, right? But at some point, if, pu if push comes to shove, whose is it? Who's the owner? Mom and dad, right? In the end, it's like, we let you think you're owners. You get to play, you have some ownership. You get to do some stuff. But if we want to take it at some point in time, if we want to repossess that, if you're not handling well what you've been given, that car that's, that, that, that we're providing, it, we own it. You can feel like you own it, but, but we own it, right? And so there's responsibility that comes, and, and ownership is transferred in some ways, responsibility. But ultimately, God is the owner. God is over all of that. And so he has the ownership prerogative. And if he's got the ownership prerogative, we've gotta do what the owner wants. What does the owner want to accomplish? What are his purposes? What are his goals? What does he want to do with what is his? And so when we have this basic understanding that God is the owner, it's a fundamental shift that maybe, again, if you're new to faith or is beginning this journey is start thinking like, man, this is not really mine. I thought that was mine. I thought that number in the bank account, I thought in my investments, you know, I thought that was all mine. Well, it's, it's God's. And one way as believers that we acknowledge that is to have a heart of gratitude, is to continue to remind ourselves. We need that constant reminder because it's so easy to think that it's ours. You know, we don't just stop and pause before prayer because it's some kind of, before a meal for prayer because it's a ritual. It's, a, it's one of those examples that just we pause and we say, God, thank you for providing. And when we say that prayer, thank you for providing for us. Maybe, again, you walk around your house and you look, and when you pull up to your house today, you go, God, thank you for providing this home. When you drive to work, and even if you're maybe not happy going to work, you go, God, thank you for my job. The next time you get your paycheck, thank you, God, for providing for me. As you look around the things you have in your closet, you go, God, thank you. And we continue to, to, to reflect back to God that he is the owner. He is the Lord. And so, so that's an important foundational principle for us. And it makes all the difference in everything else that we cover. God is the owner. But there's also a second piece in this verse that's so critical, and it's this. We are all managers. If God's the owner, we are all managers. The biblical word is, is, is stewards, many times. If you've heard that word stewardship, and that's getting used again more in financial circles as well, to be a steward, to be a manager, to, to take care of the things that, that God has done for us. There's a key word here that I just think is so powerful, and it's that word entrusted. The word entrusted. He says this man went away on a long journey, called his servants together, and he entrusted them with some of it says his money, right? In that, that verse, he entrusted them. To be entrusted, to be given trust, to think that God entrusts us, that he looks at each one of us and goes, I'm gonna entrust you with this. I'm gonna go away for a while. I got some things to take care of, you know, I'm gonna, I, I, and I've given you this mission. I'm gonna entrust you to take care of what I've provided for you and what I've given to you. And that makes, that makes a big difference. Because now as, when we're entrusted, we become managers. We become stewards. We have to take care of what's been given to us. Ever hear the word fiduciary responsibility when it comes to financial things? All right, fiduciary, it's big. What does that mean? It means that the person who's entrusted with my money acts in my best interest. They have a fiduciary responsibility, which isn't, they're gonna try to invest the money and do some things in their best interest. I'm gonna get the most you know, fees out of this and this will work really well for me. No, they have to do what's in my best interest as the owner of the, of the resources I'm entrusting to them. God is saying to us, look, you have a fiduciary responsibility to handle this in the best way that honors God, in a way that advances what he has in mind for us. To be entrusted is a, is a huge responsibility. 
I remember back when, uh, when I was in college, um, most of the time in, in college, uh, kids will move out and leave their parents. Well, when I was in college, my parents moved out and left me. They did, they did. I, I was, uh, it, my sister, my two older sisters were, were married and my parents and my younger sister went to, back to Germany, uh, to Switzerland for a year where they were gonna pastor a church and decide whether they would continue long-term, which they eventually did. But in that year of making that decision, they didn't sell our house, they didn't really liquidate anything and, and move, they just, they just went for time and they left me in the house in, in, in Michigan, Sterling Heights, Mich Michigan, outside of Detroit. So there I was as a college student, had the whole house to myself, I had the car to myself, all the furniture, the refrigerator, all this. It was great, you know, I mean, had all this stuff. But my dad I mean, entrusted me, my parents entrusted me with their checkbook. I had to pay the bills. There was no automatic bill payment and all that. I mean, I had to like get all the bills, pay all the bills. If something broke, I became a home uh, owner in that sense, a manager, right? But, but I wasn't under any illusion that this was my house and this was my stuff. I acted like it but I wasn't my stuff, right? I wanted to feel like this was my, my, my things, but I knew at some point my parents were coming back. And it was gonna make a difference on what condition the house was left in and what condition the finances were left in if I was gonna have any future trust with my parents. And they entrusted that to me. And I, and I think I learned this responsibility of being a manager, being a steward, having a fiduciary responsibility. And that's what God says to us. We are managers. We have been entrusted. And to think that God says, I trust you. I believe that, that, that you're gonna take what I've given you and do something for the kingdom of God with that. I believe in you, I trust you. And so he did. He entrusted us and he's given us this privilege. Now, let me just say here in this, in this uh, story too, while I'm looking at it through the lens specifically of our finances and our resources, and the parable does talk about um, servants being given money, this, this parable is much broader than that. I mean, God entrusts us with so much more than just resources. He gives us gifts, he gives us talents, he gives us abilities. The, whole, you know, the family that you were born into, the place you were born in this world, any privileges, any, any opportunities that you've had. I mean, there are so many factors that come into what God has given to us. The experiences in our life, the people that we encounter. All those things give us God opportunity. And so we've been entrusted with so much more. And so I don't wanna say this parable is just tit for tat, just all about money, but it absolutely is about money as well, because that is a part of what we've been entrusted to. And so that's what I'm gonna focus on today in, in, in relation to the series. So now he, he entrusts them, he goes away. We're, ready, we're gonna go to the second verse now. We're moving, we're just flying right through this here. Matthew 25, 15. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. Well, that doesn't seem fair, right? That doesn't seem fair. Why does one get five, and one get two, and one get one? Well, the third kingdom principle is this. We are entrusted according to our abilities. Now, maybe we don't like to hear that. Maybe we don't like to think about this. We're entrusted according to our abilities, but it just makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, again, Jesus is saying this is a parable. We see this in everyday life. If you're a manager, if you're an owner, if you have uh, employees, you understand that, that some can be entrusted with more than others. Right, maybe the one that was given the five bags of silver had proved himself as a senior manager on his estate and had handled things well, and he's thinking, I can give you five, five bags of silver, five talents, I can do that. And maybe the other one with two, maybe that was an upcoming, uh, you know, a, 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 young, a young guy, young girl that was, that was a servant, and he was thinking, I, I believe that, 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 that you could do something with this, but, but you know, you still gotta show yourself a little bit more. And maybe even the one with the one thought, well, you know, you haven't always been a rock star, but at the same time, you know, I believe that you can do something with it. I still have faith in you. I still trust in you on this. And, and just, just you, you've been a good servant. Just do what you can. So he entrusts it. He divides it according to their abilities. And you know, we look at this and we might think, this, is, this just seems unfair. But if you look at the story and, and the way it is in the original as, uh, language as Jesus taught, he gave them different talents. It's called talent. And not meaning like a gift and ability. A talent was a measure of, of money. It was, it was uh, currency. And a talent in today's dollars and what I've been able to find in research is over a million dollars would be the equivalent today of a talent. So if you're here to tell me that the guy that got the one talent was just not considered very trustworthy, would, wouldn't you say if you entrust a million dollars with somebody, that's a pretty big deal? So yeah, they, nobody was kind of shafted on this. They were all given big responsibility, huge responsibility. Every one of them was entrusted with something significant. But I don't want us to get hung up on the amounts. 
Because this is where so many of us get stuck. We get, we get in the comparison game. Oh, why do those people have more than me? Why don't I ever get my fair share? Why am I always struggling? Or why can't it ever fall to me? Or some might be going, God, why did you entrust me with so much? I hate this responsibility and this burden. And some of you are going, I wish I had that problem, right? I mean, we, we compare. We look at others, and, and this is not about comparison. We're gonna see that very clearly in this parable. And here's a, this could be the third principle as well, but I'll just put it in, in another way. It's not about the starting amount. It's what you do with it that counts. This is really important. It's not about the starting amount. It's what you do with it that counts. And so we're gonna see that here in this, next, uh, in this next verse and as we go along, Matthew 25, 16 to 17. So here now, the, they've been given the, the, the different amounts of, of, of money, the silver. The, the servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. So what we see here, not only are we entrusted, you know, as God the owner, are we entrusted according to our abilities and we're managers, what we see here is the fourth principle is that we have to start with what you've been given. You just gotta start with what you've been given. That's the starting point. What did each of them do? One began to invest. The next one began to, to put it to work. He doesn't say how he did it. And the other one did some work too. I mean, digging a hole is not an easy thing. But he's getting to work. They had a plan. They each had an idea what they would do with it. They all understood, I've gotta do something. The master's coming back. What am I gonna do? Now, two began to, to work in a different way, and one just kind of played it safe. And so what we see even in this is there's this idea of like you, the, the one that played it safe was, was afraid. He just wanted to hold on to it, but the other two understood that it took some risk. To invest takes some risk, right? And, and, and risk leads to reward. This is a financial principle that we see, and even in the kingdom of God, it works the same way. Risk leads to reward. When we were uh, in Arizona, uh, Bruce Arians was the coach of the Arizona Cardinals. He's now the, the coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And, and I remember one of his uh, interviews, uh, and this kind of has stuck with me all the time. He was talking about just taking some chances in the game. And he said, hey, no risk it, no biscuit. Right? No risk it, no biscuit. You want the biscuit, you want to go for it, you're going to have to take some risk. You're going to have to take some chances. You're going to have to, have to invest in something, and, and you have to kind of let go. When you invest, you let go of what you have. And you begin to make good and wise decisions. And so if, if, these guys began to risk. They began to take a chance. But the other guy didn't want to take any chances. He buried a, you know, dug a hole in the ground, that which took some work too, but just wanted to hide it away. Just wanted to keep it there and play it safe. I think the question that we have to ask is, is how am I using what God has given me to accomplish his purpose? How am I using what God has given me? So these guys had to decide. They were each given something different and they had to decide, how am I gonna do this now? What am I gonna do? How am I gonna invest it for my master's purposes? That was the question. And so this is what they decided. Well, verse 19. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The fifth principle is this. We will be called to give an account for what we have been given. We'll be called to give an account for what we have been given. I remember working as a teenager at Kmart. I think there still might be one in the country left. I don't even know. <laughs> for all of you younger ones, that, that used to be a store, like kind of like a Target, and then not anymore. Anyway, Kmart was huge. I was, I worked in, I was the employee number 1024. I worked in the stock department in the back and opening boxes and getting stock out on the floor. And, and uh, we'd have a manager and he would come back and he'd tell us, you know, what we need to do and get these boxes out and unpack this stuff and load these racks and da -da -da, do all these things. And then he would walk out the swinging double doors and be gone and we wouldn't see him for a while. And so being teenagers, we, you know, we, we worked hard. We, we had to get our job done, but there was always some time for goofing off and, and playing around and having some fun and riding the pallet jacks and having races and shooting like clips at each other and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, we were responsible, but at the same time we were doing that stuff, it was this, like, this unknown. You never knew when the manager was gonna come through those double doors, right? And at some point he was gonna come through those double doors and the last thing you wanted to be doing is in the middle of a pallet jack race going like, Oh, hey, right? So it's like when the boss comes back, when the boss comes in, you want better be, look like you're working, right? Anyone else know that principle theory, right? <laughs> so, so here's the deal. But it, but you also want to be able to show what you've done. You want to be able to show the work and the progress. And so at some point, right, after a long time, the master returned. Jesus is coming back. There is a point in time. There is a, ref, a reckoning. There is a moment where, where, where God wants to know and see, what's my ROI, What's my return on the investment? What have, I've entrusted you now. What have you done with that? 
And so we see in the story, the master comes back and calls them to give an account. Literally, like one by one, all right, what have you done? And so we, we see the accounts of the three servants. The first servant, he's feeling pretty good. Would you feel pretty good, right? You've been, hand, you've been trusted with millions of dollars and you doubled it, right? So he, the servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more. and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest and I have earned five more. Not surprisingly, here's the master's response. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling the small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. I mean, this is what we long to hear. This is what I wanna hear from, from, from God one day. You know, and I'm, I'm wondering if the servant, as he's hearing this and he's going like, um, the small amount? <laughs> Wait a second. You mean there's more? Like the, the, this, this God who is the owner of everything, I mean, there's more to that? He's gonna actually give me more responsibility? He's gonna trust me with even more? And then he invites them to the party. Let's celebrate. I mean, this is a, a joyful thing. We don't have to fear facing God someday. We don't have to fear what, what this accounting that comes if we are faithful with what he's done. To be able to joyfully come before him and go, God, I did what I could. I went after it with everything I had. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well, the second servant now comes up and he's gotta be going, oh, good for you, buddy. Um, I didn't do quite as much, but I'm hoping I'll still get some reward because I, I worked hard too. And so he steps up. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest and I have earned two more. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling the small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Oh, I'm sorry, I, no, uh, sorry, I read, the, I read the response to the first servant. Oh no, oh wait, it's the exact same response. It's the exact same response. It's word for word, the exact same response. Wait a second. One did, doubled like five bags of silver. The other one only doubled two. What is the, the exact same response? Remember what I said? It's not the starting amount. It's what you do with it that counts, right? I think this is such a powerful part of Jesus' story. He's saying stop comparing. Stop looking at everyone else and what they have and what you have and what they don't and who, who's doing what with their money. You do what you've been given, what you've been entrusted with. And if you handle that well, you're gonna get the exact same reward as someone who maybe had more than you to work with. Don't worry about that. Stop comparing. Do with what, what you've been given. We've been called to give an account. And again, the small amount. Now the third servant comes up, and, and he's probably feeling a little more nervous. But at the same time, right, he didn't at least lose any money, right? He buried it in the ground, and so he comes with his dirty bag of silver, right, dusted it off, brought it to him. Then the servant but the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. <laughs> well, of course, he, you know, he harvests where he didn't plant. He's the owner. He's not the one who's planting the fields. He was gone on a trip. That was his job to invest. I mean, this is nothing surprising. The other two servants knew he wanted this money to be invested, to be worked, to be used. And yet he's making these excuses already and going, but at least here's your money back. Now, how would you feel if uh, when, when you started as a, as a young person, let's say someone gave you $100,000 to invest. And so you went to your, your man, you know, an account investment manager and you said, here's $100,000, I'm, I'm 20 years old and, and um, I want this really to, to, to make a huge difference in my retirement. And then it comes time for retirement and you come back and he goes, here's your 100,000. How would you feel about that? Well, 30, 40 years later, what was worth $100,000 is now worth only like 50 or $40,000, right? It's not gonna get you very far after a time. See, so, the, so he, he's coming a little nervous. Well, the, the, here's what the response is of the master. You wicked and lazy servant, ouch. Why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Not today. You're right. Hey, but it would have been a little bit more. <laughs> he's, say, he's saying even that would have been better <laughs> than nothing, right? Barely. Now throw this useless, this parable ends. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus isn't sugarcoating this. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying this. I'm, I'm just reading the Bible right here, right? This, this is, he's looking going, you, you didn't do anything? 
Wicked, lazy, get this guy out of here. Like, there's no place for you in the kingdom. You obviously didn't care about the things of the kingdom of God while I was gone. You didn't care about my kingdom now. Why would you care any further? You had all this time. You obviously made that choice that this is not of interest to you, so, so away. But you had fear. And God is even, the master is even being gracious, saying at least do something. Even if you earn .03% in the bank, would have been better than nothing. Do something with what you've been given. So we come back to that question, can we both be faithful stewards and have an abundance? This question that we were wrestling with, can we both have a lot, a lot and enough for God to provide and be considered and called faithful? Well, I love this point that Jesus is now driving this to in these next couple of verses. After the servant was, was sent away, he said this, then he ordered, take the money from this servant, the one who only buried it, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the 10 bags of silver. Then here comes this, this, this golden nugget of truth. To those who use well what they have been given, even more will be given. And they will have what? An abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. I mean, this is a, this is a powerful kingdom principle that Jesus is teaching here. We wanna hold on. And this is such a spiritual principle all over. If we hold on and we try to hold on to everything we have, in the end, we lose out everything. But the fear and the challenge and the risk of saying, God, I, I open it up. God, I'm gonna invest. I'm gonna leverage what you've given me for your kingdom and for your purposes. And, and it feels like loss, doesn't it, when you give it up? It feels like loss. It feels like I'm giving it up. I mean, if I hold on to it, I have it. But the kingdom principle is you have to let go. You have to release it in order for it to multiply, in order for it to have an abundance and so the kingdom principle is this, faithful kingdom investment leads to abundance. So investing in the kingdom of God, investing in the things that matter to God. And so we have to get on that page with God going, God, what's important for you? Your family's obviously important for God. He wants to provide, that's why he's providing for you. These servants didn't just like have to have another job while they're investing this guy's money. No, they were his servants. They were well taken care of. They enjoyed the, whatever the, the privileges and rights were of being in that estate. And, and the responsibilities, and they were provided for. God's providing for you enough for all these things, but what are the purposes of the kingdom? What does he want you to do? And so God might be asking us this question, what did you do with what I gave you? How did you advance my purposes? And we have to ask the question, am I playing it safe? Am I playing it safe, or am I gonna take some risks? I'm gonna take, and I'm gonna trust God with, with increasing amounts of, of God, okay, maybe I'll just do a little bit, and maybe we'll see what happens. You've given me one bag of silver, I'm gonna invest that. And maybe you've learned over time to be entrusted with more. And so what we wanna do is we wanna grow in our generosity. We wanna grow in our ability to be invested in the kingdom. And I wanna teach you and show you this, this, this tool, this generosity ladder. Because again, part of our discipleship, part of what it means to grow as a follower of Christ and to take steps in the kingdom is to grow in generosity. We wanna be marked by generosity. And to have uh, not that money has power over us, but that we can can, can say with money and things, God, here is increasingly what I wanna do for your kingdom. And so as we look at this generosity ladder, I wanna challenge you saying, where are you and what step can you take up the generosity ladder? Because as we grow on that generosity ladder, that's an increasing of faith and of trust and also seeing what God does in, in response. So the first level of the, the generosity ladder is simply this, start giving. Start. Are you burying in the ground what you've been given? Or are you gonna invest it in some level? Are you gonna do something with it? Just start. And what we see all the time over my years of ministry, it's that moment when somebody first gives to the church, gives to the ministry, begins to do something. We even have, we call it the dollar club. You can start with just one dollar and say, I'm a part of something that's happening in the community to help somebody in need, to have resources there for the church. But it begins to connect you to the mission and the ministry in a way. Beyond just saying I'm worshiping and I'm, I'm receiving spiritually and I'm growing and I'm praying and I'm doing those things. It's spiritual to begin to begin this route of generosity. Just start, if you haven't begun, that's the simple, even though it can sometimes be a large first step, to take that step and to start giving. Well, once you've started giving, maybe you've started giving, you've given something at some point in time, um, now the challenge is to give consistently. This is where faithfulness comes in more into place, consistently to say, all right, generosity, I, I've done some, but how can I do this consistently over time? Just, this is a part of my life. I'm gonna set aside a certain amount every week, and what happens, just like in finances in the kingdom of God, when you invest significantly and continually over time, it grows. 
So even if you start with $10 a week, you might say $10 is nothing, but at the end of the year, you've given $520. Have you ever done that, right? You saved little by little, you felt like it's not going anywhere, but over time, you realize the investment. In the kingdom, your investment grows. You're investing, so find a way to maybe take that step to say, all right, I've done here and there giving, but I wanna start giving consistently. Another step up that giving generosity ladder is to give intentionally. Now, intentionally is where I look at my finances and I look at my things and I say, okay, how do I grow intentionally in, a, in like a percentage giving? Because the Bible talks about percentage giving. It's the tithe. We're gonna look at that more later in, in, in the series as well. But the tithe is 10%. Well, intentional giving is to start saying, here's my income, here's what I have. Maybe I'll do 3% or 5% or 7 or maybe every year I'm gonna try to increase year over year. I'm just gonna try to grow in that generosity. And why, what difference does that make? Well, it starts stretching our heart. We trust God and we realize, man, I trusted God with 5% and, and look, I'm still here, I'm still alive, there's still food on my table, I'm still living uh, what, what I need, God's providing and actually he's provided in ways that's made up for that difference. I think I can trust him with maybe 6%, maybe 7%. I'm gonna, I'm gonna trust, this is the faith aspect of how we grow. And, and we can't just lock in somewhere, it's, it's the idea of growing towards the tithe. That's the idea of giving intentionally. Well, the next rung on that ladder is, the, is, is to give a tithe. This is a biblical principle. This is a, this is a benchmark that's been set through Scripture as this 10%, the first 10%. has been a faithful mark for, for followers of Christ in, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, those that have supported the work and the mission of, of the temple in the Old Testament and the kingdom and the church throughout generations. To say, here's the first part, the tithe. And I think that's a, it's, it's a beautiful place and a way that we want to say, God, I want to honor you in, in that. But notice it's not the final step because it's not about a mathematical equation that says, check box, I've done one of these, or check, I've, I, I've tithed, now I'm good. Because there's another level beyond the tithe. Because well, as we talked about, who owns everything? <laughs> it's all God's anyway, right? So it's about how much we're, 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 in, we're saying we're keeping for ourselves. Well, the next the, the level is to give abundantly. To give abundantly. To begin to rearrange your life in different ways to say, look, I'm gonna do without and I'm gonna figure out and maybe in business I'm gonna take a part of my business and it's gonna fund a significant work in the kingdom of God. I'm gonna look at my, my legacy giving and my will and, 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 and how I can advance the purposes of God even after I'm, I'm here. I'm gonna find ways to be creative and to be more and more generous. You know those people who reverse tithe? Say, I'm gonna live off 10% and I'm gonna give 90% to the kingdom of God. Now again, you have to make a pretty good amount to be able to live off 10%, at least to meet basic expenses, but we always think it's easy. It's not easy. It's not, oh, they got a lot of money. No, we all have to decide for ourselves, but it's how do we grow past that? We just, uh, my, my uh, family just kind of wore, wore me down and we got another dog um, just <laughs> a week or so ago. And uh, it, it has to do with this. Um, <laughs> And so, sweet dog, her name's Bella. And we were looking at different places to, to get a dog. She's a mini Labradoodle, and, and uh, we didn't want to support, you know, like anything that's like a puppy mill or people are mistreating dogs and that kind of stuff. And so, we were researching that. Shannon was researching that. And she found this, uh, this place in, the, in rural Ohio um, that was, was selling some, some of these dogs. And so, she looked them up and then went to go and uh, visit them. They drove out a couple hours. And as she got to know the, the family, they are retired missionaries, and, um, and so they were in Africa, and now they're, they're pastoring, I think, here in, in Ohio, and yet they wanted to find a way to fund missions in, in Africa to continue to do that. And so now they raise these, these, these beautiful dogs and, uh, and, and, and breed them and then sell them, and all the profits go to the work in Africa, and they found that this is a sustainable and ongoing way to, to do that. I mean, that, that's, that, that's thinking differently in the kingdom. I mean, they could make thousands of dollars for themselves, but they're investing in that. And so we didn't end up buying one of the puppies. We got one of the mama dogs that was retiring from, from breeding, and she's sweet and, and was priced a little cheaper. Uh, and so, <laughs> but I mean, that doesn't devalue her anyway, but we couldn't afford the other ones. But we still wanted to support the mission. But anyway, that's a cool thing, right? I mean, somebody who's rearranging their lives and their purposes to say, I understand the kingdom of God. I want to do something in that way, even beyond just a portion of what we're doing. I want to give all of it. And so how do we grow on this piece? And it's so easy for me, too, just to say, okay, check, God, tithing. That's been a part of what I've been doing. But I'm trying to say, okay, God, how can I continue to grow in generosity? It's not like some kind of checkbox. It's, it's, a, it's a continual growth. And so you look at this, this giving, this generosity ladder. And what could happen? What would it be like if we all, on a regular basis, assessed where we're at and say, God, where can I trust you with another step of faithfulness? 
another step of trust. You've provided for me. I'm here. My heart's beating. My things have been provided for, God. I'm going to trust you. And, and instead of seeing it as greater loss, what if we saw it as more to gain? If we saw it as, oh, if you've been entrusted with a little, God's going to say, I'm going to bless you with even more. You'll have an abundance, that principle that's there. God is faithful and will provide. And we'll talk some more about that in the weeks to come. How do we grow in that faithfulness? How do we come to the day and the point in time where Jesus says, well done, my good and faithful servant? And remember, in the end of all this, he says, let's celebrate together. This isn't intended to be kind of a heavy, burdensome, laborsome thing. This is about joyful giving. This is about joyfully investing, going, God, I wanna be about the kingdom of God. I wanna do and be a part of what you're doing in this world. You've blessed me so much, I want to be faithful in what you've given me. And to hear God say one day, well done, my good and faithful servant. Let's celebrate together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this challenge. And God, this reminder in this story, it's not a heavy-handed story that, whoa, be careful, I'm gonna return someday. But God, to, to say, can we be a part of your purposes? We love being a part of your kingdom, God. We, we, we are so thankful that you have loved us and given your life for us and that you care for us, and that you provide for us, and that you give us hope and forgiveness. You give us healing, you give us freedom. And Father, we want others to experience that. We wanna be about these purposes in your kingdom. So Father, on on behalf of all of us here, I just say thank you for the, the abundant blessings that you shower on us each and every day. Help us to see them with eyes wide open. And Father, may we joyfully be about your work in the kingdom to be generous with what you've given us, to, to, to challenge ourselves to keep growing and to trust you and to see your faithfulness in that. And Father, we celebrate the impact of what's happening all around us, lives that are changed, the growth that's happening and, and people's, uh, the, the transformation in this place and in the community and around the world. We're so thankful we get to be a part of that. Lord, thank you for blessing us in so many ways. And God, thank you for your faithfulness to us. We give you honor and praise. In Jesus' name, amen.